Hello, I'm Ben Wattenberg. The rise in the stock market is becoming topic number one at the office water cooler. What will the Dow do next? It's already touched 11,000. When will it hit 15,000, 20,000, 30,000? Or will it come tumbling down? Two of today's guests think the stock market is undervalued, way undervalued. They argue in a forthcoming and provocative new book that the Dow Jones average should be valued at 36,000 today. The co-authors of Dow 36,000 are James Glassman, the DeWitt Wallace Reader's Digest Chair at the American Enterprise Institute and a financial columnist for the Washington Post, and Kevin Hassett, resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute and co-author of The Magic Mountain, A Guide to Defining and Using a Budget Surplus. Glassman and Hassett's views do not go unchallenged on this program. They are joined by a skeptic, Robert Schiller of Yale University and author of Market Volatility. The topic before the house, Dow 36,000, question mark. This week on Think Tank. The stock market has soared to new heights at the end of the 1990s. Back in 1981, when Ronald Reagan took office, the Dow Jones Industrial Average stood at around 800. When President Clinton took office in 1993, it hovered near 3,200. Now it's over 10,000. This unprecedented rise in the market has prompted some to ask, is something different going on this time? To answer this and other questions, we turn to our panel. Glassman and Hassett, I'll just sort of use that as a, <laughs> uh, as, as, as a one, maybe we'll start with you, Jim. Glassett. You are both known as devotees of the market. You believe in the workings of the market. And yet, it occurred to me, as I understand your thesis, you were saying that not only is the market wrong now by pricing the Dow at 11,000, but it's been wrong for decades. And it should be right now, the, the market, this all wonderful thing that you guys worship, is making this phenomenal mistake and saying it should be three times higher. Well, well, we have, well first of all, Ben, we why? have a lot of respect for markets. But, you, well, but, but big it's quite but. possible yeah. that markets make mistakes and they certainly have in the past and what's happening now is is a process of learning that's been going on that we think explains what's happened in the last 20 years let me just give you one example of a mistake that markets learn from back in the 1950s 19 actually 30s 40s into the late 50s people believed that stocks were just so risky that they demanded in a stock that it pay a dividend that was higher than the rate on treasury bonds. That's completely, people would be baffled by that today, where interest rates, where dividends are like two or three percent. In those days, the dividends from a stock were higher than from a treasury bond. Well, new information and came out. And now they're out. about a third or so, something like yeah, that. Yeah, now right? it's about a third. In new information came out. People learned that, gosh, you know, the truth is that stocks are not risky, so risky that you need to demand that kind of a dividend. And starting in 1958, a shift occurred. And that shift persists today. 40 years later, stocks have consistently paid pay dividends lower than the dividends of Treasury bonds, which we now think is quite logical today. That's the kind of paradigm shift that we think is going on right now with stocks in general. Kevin, you used to work as a senior economist at the Federal Reserve Bank under Chairman Greenspan. That's right. You and Jim obviously believe what Jim just said, that a major paradigm shift is going on at the same time your, your former boss, Chairman Greenspan, give or take a few years and a few syllables, is talking that the market may be overpriced and is irrationally exuberant. That's right. The, the, that's right. We, we do not believe that the market right now is plagued by over-exuberance at, at all. I, I think the, the important thing to remember, and something that, that Jim and I recognize in our book uh, and, and acknowledge over and over again uh, when we speak about this is that the market is always uh, a tension. There's always a tension in the market between the argument for things going up and the argument for things going down. 
And a, a rational investor should look at the two arguments and decide which one he or she believes. And, and you know, we set out to just identify the argument for up because every argument we were seeing was the argument for down. And as we looked more and more at it, we found it reasonably convincing. Uh, okay, we, we're going to come back in just a moment to the. Can debate. I add one thing about Greenspan? I mean, you know, I'm a great admirer of Alan Greenspan. So I'm sure Kevin's an even greater admirer. But the truth is, from the time he made that speech, December 5th, 1996, until the present day, the Standard Poor's 500 index has returned over 80%. So I mean, lots gone, of people have gone up by 80%. Gone up 80% has, so. has gone up 80%, including its dividends. All right, we, we're going to return to your specific theory as to why the Dow is going to triple. But uh, Bob Schiller, uh, do you think the market is, is high now? Yes. Too high? Uh, well, the Dow should probably be 6,000, if you're, you're going to throw out numbers. <laughs> we, we differ by well, a fact, by <laughs> factor of about six. Sure. I was hoping to... Uh, so you're, you're saying, give or take, it should be cut in half, and you're saying it should triple. Other, other than that, you're in perfect agreement. Well, there's great uncertainty about all of this, and I <clears> really don't want to say that I know where the Dow should be. Right. Uh, absolutely not. Having now, just, said it, also having say, just said it. No, and we, we're no, the incidentally, same. I, I, didn't, I should correct that. I was saying that if historical attitudes toward risk persist, then it would be reasonable that the Dow would be at 6,000. But I am, a, I am in agreement with you that it has been historically underpriced. So it should be maybe a little bit. And, uh, and, and we agree with Bob that, that if uh, people went back to being as fearful of stocks as they, as they historically have been, then 6,000 is probably a, a number that you could get very, very easily. You, you wrote, Bob, in August of 1997. Everybody in this business has written something that's dead <laughs> wrong. I may as well get it out early. Uh, you wrote in intellectualcapital.com uh, in an article entitled 1929 Redux that, quotes, we have a market that by many indicators is more overvalued than at any time since that fateful summer. Now that was about two years ago and the market's gone up, what, 50% since then? That's true. You won't disagree with that by the ratios, it has never, this is a historic moment. That we have to ref sit and reflect. We may have a disagreement, but we agree on that. that that's, uh, if so the old ratios t tell you what's going to happen. Then he was right. Then he was right. right. And, and, and so it's and time I, to rethink uh, the old okay, ratios now, now, or now, that's going to happen. Now we come <laughs> to, the, to the crux of this matter. Uh, Jim and Kevin, you say the market is underpriced. Tell us why. The standard measurements for whether the market's overpriced or not are things like price-to-earnings ratios and dividend yields. And the price-to-earnings ratio is how many dollars does it cost when you buy a stock to buy a dollar's worth of earnings of a company. And that's at a historic high, and dividend yields are at a historic low. But we believe, and we think there's a lot of evidence, that these indicators really aren't telling us very much anymore, and that they ought to be sort of pushed to the side. We can still look at them, uh, but really it's much more significant to look at other things. And what we think is going on is that people are bidding up the prices of stocks because they understand, investors understand, what economists have known for a long time, which is that stocks are an incredible deal. They're a really, really good deal. And that over the long term, they are no more risky than, say, bonds. And if they're no more risky over the long term, they ought to return about the same as bonds, which means that their prices ought to go up. And that's really what's going on right now. We think it's a rational response to uh, a circumstance that has prevailed for a long time, but people are just waking up to it for a number of reasons. Well, it, it, it can't be a rational response if it's a third below what you think it ought to be. One of you, either the market or you, are wrong. It's a process. It's a okay? process. Just, okay. just as Bob's, uh, Bob Schiller says that, gee, the market ought to be at 6,000. He's saying it ought to be. He's also contradicting what's going on with the market. We don't think that, you know, I don't think anybody believes, even if okay. believers in efficient market theory, that the market is so, exactly so, properly so priced every second. The, the root of your theory is that bonds and stocks are equally risky. Right, and by the way, that is not a controversial notion, that over the long term, the volatility, which is the extremes of the ups and downs, of stocks and bonds are roughly the same. In fact, Jeremy Siegel, pro distinguished professor at Wharton, argues in his very important book, Stocks for the Long Run, he says flatly, in fact, that stocks are less risky than bonds over long periods of time. It's not a controversial notion. Is it not a controversial notion? Historically, you're right. But with inflation more stable, now I'm not sure that's still true, 
uh, and because it's the inflation risk that mm -hmm. creates the risk in bonds. Um, and secondly, we have index bonds now. Um, and what strikes me when looking at the level of the market is you can now buy a U.S. Treasury 30-year index bond, which is perfectly safe. A indexed for indexed inflation. to inflation. Right. So that means the real value is right. guaranteed, and you can get 3.9 percent. You compare that with the S&P, and the earnings yield on that is 2.8 percent. Uh, so it seems to me that uh, we've got kind of like a negative <laughs> equity well, premium. It's but going they, they have a reason, uh, which the, Kevin will yeah, now. The, he explained it to me in the green room before. Now, now, so so that's the base. The right. the the base is that they're not any any more risky, and therefore what? Okay. Uh, therefore, it ought to be the case that stocks and bonds put about the same amount of cash in your pocket over time. It's if there were two types of bond and they had the same risk characteristics, then they ought to be priced about the same. You ought to get about the same rate of return. Just if you bought an AT&T bond or an IBM bond, for example, then they're sort of about the same company in terms of how risky they are, what a great blue chip company they are, and they ought to give you about the same amount of cash. And, and so our calculation that yields to uh, Dow 36,000 is just that. You know, what, what um, would have to happen to prices today so that at, from that point on, uh, the returns on stocks and bonds ought to be about the same. Now, there's some uncertainty about the exact level, um, but our assumptions, I think, are, are pretty darn G cautious. Give, give me history. an example of, of what that means. I, I understand it on the bond side. In other words, I take $100, it's paying 6%. And so I'm going to get $6 a year. It's a 20-year bond. I get $6 a year in the mail for the next 20 years. Now, how does that relate to the price of a given stock? That's what I, I don't quite... Right. Well, the difference between the amount of cash that a stock delivers and the amount of cash that a bond delivers is, is very simple. Uh, the cash from the stock grows over time. And... Uh, it starts lower, but It starts grows. lower, and it gets higher. Uh, so, so if you put $100 in Exxon in 1977, you'd be getting a, a dividend back then of about five, six dollars. Uh, and relative to your initial stake, uh, the dividend today is uh, almost thirty dollars. If you totaled up all the cash, that, let's say an, Exxon, bond, an Exxon, Exxon dividends paid you over a 30-year period, and compared that to what a bond would have paid you over that period, it would be like about four times as much. And we're talking about Exxon, which is not a super growth so, stock. So, 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 so that's too the, much so, money. So, right. so then the Exxon shares that were selling for 100 in 1978 should have really been selling to be equal, should have been selling at 400. Yeah, although, you know, one of the things that we talk about in the book is that the circumstances today are quite different from what they were right. in 1977. We're, we're going to come to that. Yeah, right. So, so in 77, it might have been a time when people's uh, aversion to risk made a lot of sense. They were, they were scared. Now, it doesn't make as much right, sense now, today. Bob, let me ask you, so far you, you've heard this thesis, mm -hmm. and I know you've heard it before. Uh, some other experts have called it uh, stupid and insane, to use two that, <laughs> that the authors themselves are, 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 are promoting. They gave this out at a, recent, like uh, at, a recent, <laughs> at a recent discussion. They were bragging that Mr. Bruska, former chief economist of Nico Securities, said this was a stupid article and that somebody from the Australian Financial Review called it insane. Now, what you've heard so far, is that either stupid or insane? The problem is that I don't think your numbers really support that. Can you still change the title of the book? I mean, how about Dow 15,000? Mm -hmm. Well, you're saying it should be worth 6,000. No, I mean, we can't change the title <laughs> of the book. We agree that there's uncertainty about the exact level. Can I give the calculation? Can I give the calculation? It's yeah, very please. simple. But, yeah. Right now, index bonds, 30-year index bonds, are paying 3.9%, okay? Okay, the S&P index, the stock market, is paying 1.24%. That's the okay. yield, yes. the dividend yield of, right. of those shares. And so, um, say 1.2 to 3.9, uh, the difference is 2.7%. Uh, so, in order for that to be made up, you have to expect 2.7% growth. But historically, it's only been, as you say, only 2%. So, it sounds like the S&P index uh, based on this sort of calculation, will underperform uh, the riskless bonds. Right, but Bob, you, you know as well as I do, in fact, all economists are, have been scratching their heads over these index bonds ever since they come out. These index bonds, which in fact are a pretty good investment, I think your yeah, viewers should know that. And we, we treat them in the book and we, tell people to buy them, yeah. have their bond part of their portfolio be in these things. Right, they are, they are paying a terrific, they're a terrific deal. Nobody expected 
that the real interest rate on these bonds will be 3.8, 3.9 percent. It's almost a percent, percent higher than the real rate you would get from looking at the non-index treasuries and subtracting the expected inflation that the CBO has in their forecast, for example. Yeah, so, so, so they are they are an anomaly. anomaly. Right these bonds are an anomaly, and I think that, that you know, I mean, this is my guess, I don't know if Bob would agree, but I think over time people are going to understand what a terrific deal these bonds, people don't even understand these bonds, and uh, over time people are going to realize, hey, they're a pretty good deal, and, and as a result, those real rates will drop down. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't really get fixed. That's another reason to bonds. invest in them no, now. That, that, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Right. And, and, and if we and if we were to, uh, and so so Bob Bob gave us the fifteen thousand if we use those bonds, and if we think that three percent instead of three point nine. Is the, is the right rate? Then it's going to be. He's, he's Bob's our. No, all fifteen thousand was on the really high side. I, that's what I hope to bargain you down. <laughs> <laughs> to <laughs> but, but, but wait a minute. But but this is not just a question of bargaining. Your original view was that it's not that it should be fifteen rather than thirty-six, but that it should be six rather than eleven. I, I, I mean, we, we are not talking uh, apples and applesauce here. We're talking apples and elephants. You, you, the, the, they're saying the world has changed. Or as we say, the earth has moved, right? Okay, and, and you're saying, oh no, it hasn't. I mean, same old, same old. Well, see, uh, they could be right. Uh, I, I would just grant that at the beginning. And the world does change. And it's a mistake to always assume that history will repeat itself. But that's one reason why we also have to accept that there's some risk to stocks. Uh, we don't know. It's true that every 30-year period in stock market history, stocks have outperformed bonds. Like every 20 and years, isn't it? Well, also? not quite 20, I not don't quite think. 20? Okay. It's very uh, close on 20. Uh, close on 20. Okay. But how many 30-year periods have we had in the stock market history, non-overlapping? You know, it's like four. depends on what you call it. And, well, and but even suppose if, they, you, even but if suppose it's true, you how do we know But suppose you overlap them, then you have 100 or, or more. I mean, that if doesn't you really, said, they're not independent. The, the hmm. fundamental thing is that the stock market is a residual claimant. If you own shares, you get money after everybody else is paid and there are no guarantees. People know that. The government is not guaranteeing the stock market. The FDIC is not guaranteeing it. Nobody is guaranteeing it, and it's tough luck if you invest in stocks and it goes down. That, well, sounds, no, nobody, that sounds very reasonable. Well, except that nobody's guaranteeing bonds either. There was a time, except for these one kind of special bonds of which there's like $60 billion outstanding, which right, is not very, very much. Well, but they're, but, very they're, but they're guaranteed, guarantees but they're bonds, guaranteed by corporate law, which says the bondholders get paid no, first. No, no, by guarantee, they, they, what I mean is no, there's no. no protection against inflation. Well, there's a partial... Uh, no, there okay, isn't. Let me just I give I you an see, example. I, I, no, there's no, 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 there's no protection when against inflation. Happens, right, right, that that protection right. isn't as valuable as you might think, too. So, well, so by the time the company's for a corporation, in the tank, but even being for, first in line at the tank isn't so good. But even, yeah. even Treasury bonds, I'll just give you an example, which is in Jeremy Siegel's book, that if you look at the worst period for bonds over a worst 20-year period, overlapping 20-year period, so there were, you know, there were dozens, and there were 190 of them or something like that, uh, 180 of them, you find that the worst period for bonds in real terms, that's after inflation is factored out, is minus 3.1%. That's annually over a 20-year period, man, you really have lost a lot of purchasing power. Whereas the worst period for stocks, 20-year period for stocks, is plus 1%. So bond, to believe that bonds are not risky is to be making a huge mistake. Let me, let me ask another question. There's all this talk going on in the economic community about whether or not uh, there is a new paradigm. In other words, as we said in the setup piece, is something different, is there something intrinsically different? And if you go back, say, to the mid-1980s and say, well, what would one, two, three smart fellows say as to, if I said, how would you improve the economy of America and the world? You'd say, well, we ought to deregulate, we ought to go to more trade, we ought to end the Cold War, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the funny thing happened is we did all of those things, and what do you know, the economy, at least in the United States, is taking off just as if we had done all those things. Now, the question is, is what you are talking about, which is a continued rise in the stock market, is that due to this sort of arcane misreading of the market that you call the, uh, the risk premium, or is it due to some titanic major shift in the way people do business? Well, the reason, one of the reasons that the risk premium is going down, in our view, in other words, the reason that people feel that stocks are less risky than they thought they did, is because of these political and economic changes that you just described. I mean, the fact that, for example, the, the 
very simply. The fact that we don't have a Cold War and that there's you know, not a nuclear threat. That's good stuff. Right. That makes people feel safer about their long-term investments. The fact that American corporations have done a very good job reorganizing themselves, that we have a better monetary regime. There are a lot of things. But what we do not believe, and I want to make this very clear because there are a bunch of books out on this same subject, is we do not believe that stocks will rise to 36,000 because of some kind of fantastic new economy paradigm where the economy, instead of rising at a, a real rate of 2 or 2.5% two a year, is going to suddenly jump to 35 or 4%. I don't rule that out, mm -hmm. but that's not part of right. our theory. And that's an upside argument, too. I mean, I mean, so if you gave us 4% uh, real GDP growth, which is what we've seen three years in a row, I guess, uh, then you'd get a number well, well above the, the, the number the that The stock we're market, the value of the S&P has grown by 20% 20, 20 a year or more for the last three years, is that right? Last four years in a row, which has never happened before and in the stock market. And it's looking like it's going to do it again. Or, well, so far is, uh, Bob Schiller, you're in the role of the skeptic here. Is that just an anomaly, or are these guys up to something? I mean, it's four years is right. four years. That's not chicken soup or chopped liver right, or whatever. No, it's, it's quite to a be. remarkable phenomenon, mm -hmm. unanticipated by mm -hmm. just about anybody. Mm -hmm. But uh, the issue that uh, is whether an important part of it, as you argue, is that people have learned something, uh, learned that stocks are not risky, or is it something else? And there's a number of other psychological theories that have added into this. Um, one of them is that they've seen the market go up so long, many times, uh, that they just think it has to, can only go up. That's, that's one theory. Another, th mm -hmm. there are other... Th can, can I respond to that? Because I, I, I think that, um, that one, one of the, the big motivations for us as we worked through this book was the, the work that Bob and some of his colleagues have done in this area. Because we think that, um, that the work identifying the mistakes that people have made in the past in the market, that they were too fearful of, about stocks, too prone to sell the first time they went down and so on. We think that that work ha has diffused out to financial professionals who are acting kind of like psychologists. They're helping people through their neurosis of, uh, towards well, stocks and, and, you were and teaching them how, how to behave correctly. Were, and that's one reason why we think this well, sort of learning process the, is going on. Uh, you were pointing out that the number of investors and the kinds of investments, the 401ks and things like that, play into your scenario. I mean, as more people... That's right. So there are more and more people putting their money in the market. They're locking it up for the long term so that these long-term statistics about riskiness might be more relevant. And so, so we think that those forces drive stocks to higher prices. And, and, but I think the fundamental question is, you know, three or four years from now, uh, will the PE have gone back to 20 or not? If the PE, P can, the price to price earnings, earnings ratio, ratio that's multiple, right. which is about these, 30 now or something, the, will um, it go back to 20 or? That's right. Or, or is or it going to go up to 40 or 50 or, or even above and, and, or stay where it is? I mean, those are the three possibilities. But we think that if it goes up again, and it, and, it, and it continues to increase at the rate that we've seen in the last few years, then the story is going to have to be our story. It, it's well, the only know, one that makes your sense. Your colleague Herbert Stein says that a trend that cannot continue will not. Yeah. So, I mean, well, you, in, you, you, indeed, you're, you're not well, saying we don't think we're going to go up to 100 or 1,000. I mean, no, 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 Ben. I mean, we, we, we believe that, that stock, when stocks reach what we call their perfectly reasonable price, or PRP, that indeed they will level off because they've gotten to they the point to where the amount of cash that goes into your pockets will be the same and, as and bonds. the question is, where is that price? Yeah. That's, that, that's the question. You say PRP, that's new. I, I, I thought PHP called Permanently High Plateau, <laughs> <laughs> which was Irving Fisher in One 1929. One of your colleagues. <laughs> in 1929. It's really interesting that Irving Fisher in 1929 said there's a new era. He said that the price was right, ratio was will be high. It's called depression. <laughs> but, but you know what? We, if, if, you listen, if you listen to Bob and, and John Campbell when they wrote their a very bearish article that they gave at the Federal Reserve a few years ago and shorted the market the instant you saw the paper, you'd have lost more money than the people who listened to Irving. I mean, so, so this is a I very strange that. statement. You didn't. Incidentally, I, I was still in the market. Well, and I think that is the point. No, and, and, and Bob brings up an important point, which we talk about in the book. We talk about Irving Fisher in the book. One of the problems with Irving Fisher was he went he went way overboard. I mean, he put every dime he could find. He in mortgaged the market his house and put to, the money in the market to prove that he was right. But you know, the truth is that over the long term, I mean, if, if Irving Fisher himself hadn't mortgaged everything to put it in the market, he was right. I mean, the fact is, if you had bought and held, even if you bought at the worst possible time, just before the depression, and held on for a long time, you would have done. You would have done extremely well until 1954 around <clears> that. It had to be a long time before. No, if you reinvest, no, dividends, reinvest in dividends, okay. when you're, no. when okay. you're okay. Okay. Right. Thank you, uh, Jim Glassman, uh, Kevin Hassett, and Bob Schiller.
and thank you. We encourage feedback uh, from our viewers via email. For Think Tank, I'm Ben Wattenberg. We at Think Tank depend on your views to make our show better. Please send your questions and comments to New River Media, 1150 17th Street Northwest, Washington, D.C., 20036. Or email us at thinktank at pbs.org. To learn more about Think Tank, visit PBS online at www.pbs.org. And please let us know where you watch Think Tank. This has been a production of BJW Incorporated in association with New River Media, which are solely responsible for its content.